Right. So we're supposed to be doing things his way, doing things Jesus's way. And one of the parts of that, one of the biggest parts of that is, has to do with what we preach. And when I talk about what we preach, I'm talking about what someone would preach behind a pulpit or out in their lives. Uh, we preach his message. We don't get to just make things up on our own and just to tell people about. Uh, we, are to pre we are to preach his message. Let's go ahead and open up our Bibles to Romans 10, 14. Uh, and I just want to read this really quick. Uh, it says, How then shall they call upon him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And uh, you've probably heard me say this multiple times now. This is one of my favorite verses. But uh, how shall they hear without a preacher? So it's very obvious that in order for people to hear the message of Christ, that message has to be preached. Throughout our lives, we need to be proclaiming the gospel or the good news. But what is the good news? The good news is not that I got a new car or something like that. The good news is the life and death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ, right? Right? That is the good news, mankind being redeemed before God. So what is this message that we are to be preaching? What about that should we be telling people? I've heard people say at times, well, uh, I want to evangelize or I want to share the gospel, but I don't know what to say. I don't know what to say to people. And it's easy to say to that person, well, just go and tell them about Jesus, right? That's a, that's a very easy thing just to tell someone. But what, are, what about Jesus are they supposed to tell them? Are they supposed to just quote the entire book of John uh, and say, okay, well, I shared the gospel. A lot of people can't do that. Most people can't do that or with any other of the gospel uh, books in the Bible. And so... This is a question that needs to be answered. How are we to effectively tell people about Christ? You see, simply uh, telling someone to go tell people about Jesus doesn't really prepare them to share the gospel. So what should we preach about? Well, Acts chapter 2 records Peter preaching one of the first gospel messages given by the apostles, right? This is... This is right after the day of Pentecost. Um, and from this, we can learn what we should be preaching about. Uh, he gives us a kind of blueprint for the things that we are to say to people. Let's go ahead and pray before we move further. Dear Lord, thank you for this day that we get to come together and worship you, Lord. Uh, I pray, Lord, that as we dive into your word this morning, that you would just keep our hearts and our minds open uh, to what you have to teach us and help us to be proclaiming your word, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So before we get into the passage that we're actually going to be reading, I want to give some context in this. So in Acts chapter 2, uh, it starts off with the day of Pentecost, with the, with the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we know that that was for the church. That was a one-time event. Uh, and then they started to speak in tongues as a result of that. And so they, they spoke in many other languages. Uh, not, you know, the, it was other languages that people could understand. Um, and people started to claim that these men were drunk. Uh, and Peter uh, spends the first part of his message explaining that they were not drunk, uh, that uh, this was the Holy Spirit working uh, in them. And so the first part of his message, Peter is answering that question. Now, what we're going to read this morning is the second part of that message. Uh, and this is really what shows us what we are to be going out and telling people uh, as far, regarding Jesus. So let's go ahead and go to Acts chapter 2, and we're going to start with verse 22, and we're going to read through 39, and then we will break it down. So it says, Men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, 
wonders and signs which God did through him in your midst. As you yourselves also know, him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, whom God raised up, having loosed the, loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand that I may not be shaken. Therefore, my heart rejoiced and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you uh, allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him that of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up, of which we are all witnesses, therefore being exalted to the right hand of God, and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this which you now see and hear. For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has, ra- sorry, has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now, when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, men of brethren, or sorry, men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promise is to you and to your children and to all who are afar off as many as the Lord our God will call. And so if we are to use what Peter says here as a guide for how we are to preach for our own preaching, right? Uh, we see here the essential elements uh, that, we, that should be present any time we are presenting the gospel. And so there, there's some very essential things uh, that Peter says here that we are to include any time we are sharing the gospel. And that's what we're going to point out this morning. So first of all, our preaching is about Jesus, right? Our preaching is about Jesus. Now, that may seem obvious to everyone in this room, but it's not obvious to the people in the world, right? It's not obvious to other denominations who a lot of times preach other things other than Jesus, about prosperity and things like that. So our preaching is to, is to be focused on Christ, no matter what. Uh, that's in the very first verse that we covered this morning. Acts 2, 22, it says, Men of Israel, hear these words. And the very first thing that he says, Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested by God to you by miracles, wonders, and signs, which God did through him in your midst as you yourselves also no. And so the first thing that Peter says here uh, in, in this verse is Jesus of Nazareth, right? And showed himself by all of the signs and miracles and was attested to by God through these things. And he did these things in their midst. So the very first thing that Peter points to is that Jesus was here and he did all of these things. And so the first thing in our Preaching should be about Jesus and all of the wonderful things that he did 
Even if we have to paraphrase sometimes, as long as we are in agreement with Scripture, we're on solid ground there. So, first of all, with this, we are all commanded to preach. We are all commanded to preach. Uh, this is not just something that we do behind the pulpit, right? Everybody is to be proclaiming Jesus Christ in their lives, right? Uh, Mark 16, 15, this is the command here. It says, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. Very simple command there. Go and preach to everyone. Also, we are to preach the gospel and nothing but the gospel. Paul spoke to this in 1 Corinthians 9, 16. It says, For if I preach the gospel, I have nothing to boast of, for necessity is laid upon me. Yes, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So Paul is saying it is a necessity for him to preach the gospel. Excuse me. And he says, woe is me if I do not preach the gospel. So we're not to be preaching anything else but the word of God. That's it. We should also not let other things overshadow Jesus when we are presenting the gospel. So whether it's, again, behind the pulpit or out in our lives, we are to not let anything overshadow Jesus. Now, the way this happens a lot of times is uh, people will start talking about themselves more than they're really talking about Jesus, or they'll start talking about the other person more than they're talking about Jesus. You know, God wants you to be prosperous. God wants all of these things for you. You, 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 me, 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 right? We hear this stuff in the world all the time with false, that's false gospel there. If it's not focused on Jesus, it is false gospel. So the message is not about you. The message is about Jesus. Also, we see this on holidays and stuff a lot, or you know, a lot of the minor holidays, right? Uh, the message is not about a special occasion. And so when we're preaching on a holiday, it's okay to incorporate some of those things into a message, to use those things to preach about Jesus. But if you are using an opportunity to preach about Jesus, to preach about those things, right, then it's not good. You know, a lot of the, what this happens a lot with, and I hear it all the time, with the Super Bowl, right? Is the message about the Super Bowl? Or is the message about Jesus and you just happen to be incorporating some football into the message? Because if that is a question, you are not presenting the gospel. Also, the message is not about an analogy. And so we can use analogies when we are talking to people. But if it is more about the analogy than it is about Jesus, then you are not presenting the gospel. Very simple thing. So we cannot let these things overshadow Christ. My next major, major point this morning, and we see this in this passage here, is our preaching, uh, our message here should convict people. We cannot just go, go around telling everyone about all the sunshine and daisies. It is good to tell people about the love of God. Don't get me wrong. But people need to know why uh, they need forgiveness from God. People need to know that they are wretched, awful sinners before God, and they need Him. And that shows God's love for us, that He gave His Son to die for us. We cannot just tell people the good part without telling them the bad also. Acts 2.23 uh, Peter drives this home here. He says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, notice what he says, You have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death. 
So Peter's talking to them and he's saying, Jesus was crucified because of you. And so when we are talking to people, people need to understand that not just, you know, Jesus came and died for us, but literally Jesus came and died because of us. The reason why Jesus had to die on the cross is because of our sins. People need to be confronted with their sin. Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All have sinned, right? So we're no better than the people that we're talking to. We've all been there. But people need to know that they have sinned before God. Also, again, people need to be confronted with the crucifixion. People need to be confronted with the crucifixion. Like I said, people need to know that Jesus died on the cross because of sin. It says in Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrates his own love for us that while, in, in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. That is God demonstrating his love. So we cannot separate the two. When we talk about God's love, we have to talk about how awful we are. That the fact that God wants to save us has nothing to do with whether we are a good person or not. It has to do with God's character, not ours. Also, people need to be warned of the consequences of their sin. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. See, those things cannot be separated. The wages of sin is death. Then you say, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. And so you tell them what sin costs, and then you tell them what the gift is. But people need to be warned that that cost is death. And that's eternal death in hell. People need to know. I think it's in Ezekiel 3. And I believe it's verse 18 and 19. And I'm going to paraphrase it here. Uh, but basically what that speaks to is that we, it's on us to warn people. And God says that if the the wicked man dies in his iniquity and you have not warned him. It says, their blood will I, require, will I require at your hands. But if you tell them and they still reject and they die in their iniquity, that your soul is clean, essentially. So it is our responsibility. And again, that's Ezekiel 3, 18 and 19, if you want to look it up. And it says it much better there. Uh, but... We need to warn people. It is our responsibility there. Also, our preaching should be, uh, this is important, should be about the death, burial, and resurrection. And so sometimes we go, want to tell people about Christ and we say, yeah, Christ came and died for your sins on a cross. And then we stop there, Right? Uh, how, how many times do people just stop there when they're telling people about Jesus? Don't tell them about the resurrection. I got news for you. Anybody can die. We all are going to die. The miraculous part is the resurrection there. That's what completes the whole picture. Christ came and died on a cross for all of us, was buried in a tomb, and then three days later rose from the grave. Okay? People need to know that whole picture that Jesus rose from the grave, not only died. Acts 2, 23 for, through 24, Peter uh, says this. It says, Him being delivered by the determined purpose and foreknowledge of God, you have taken by lawless hands, have crucified and put to death, 
whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So that's an essential part of Peter's sermon there, telling people not only did, uh, is it our fault that Christ was crucified, but that grave could not hold Christ, that he was raised up by God. That is an essential part of our message as Christians. Also, this goes without saying, but our preaching should contain Scripture. Right? Anybody disagree with that? Our preaching should contain Scripture. So we need to quote a little bit of Scripture, and I'm going to explain on that a little bit. So first of all, containing Scripture, right? That's an obvious one. We should quote Scripture, like I said. Acts 2, 24 through 28. This is Peter quoting Old Testament Scripture there uh, to talk to the Jews. So he's using Old Testament Scripture, and then he expounds upon it. But it says... Whom God raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be held by it. So that was Peter speaking there. Now, with the influence of the Holy Spirit, that was Peter speaking there. And then he backs it up with Old Testament scripture. It says, For David says concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is at my right hand, that I may not be shaken. Therefore my heart rejoiced, and my tongue was glad. Moreover, my flesh will also rest in hope, for you will not leave my soul in Hades, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. You have made known to me the ways of life. You will make me full of joy in your presence. And so anytime we make a statement concerning Scripture, right? Anytime we make a statement concerning Jesus, we should be ready to back it up with Scripture. Too many times people just make a statement and don't back it up at all. Uh, when we make a statement about Jesus, we should be ready to back it up. And that's what Peter does here. So he makes that statement that God raised Jesus up. And then he uses Old Testament scripture to support that viewpoint. Also, in the following verses, Peter not only quotes that scripture and uses it, but he also shows an understanding of that scripture. So that's an essential part for us as well, is not only we, can we, we can't just take verses out of context and say that they mean things that they don't, we have to show a real understanding of scripture. Acts 2, 29 through 33, it says, men and brethren, let me speak freely to you of the patriarch David. And now remember, he is referring to the scripture that he just quoted, that he is both dead and buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Therefore, being a prophet, and knowing that God had sworn with an oath to him of the, of the fruit of his body, according to the flesh, he would raise up the Christ to sit on his throne. He, foreseeing this, spoke concerning the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in Hades, nor did his flesh see corruption. This Jesus God has raised up of which we are all witnesses. Therefore, being exalted to the right hand of God and having received from the Father the promise of the Holy Spirit, he poured out this, which, we now, which you now see and hear. And so Peter shows his understanding of that scripture there. That he tells them that that's not, that wasn't about David. That was about Jesus, right? And so whenever we quote scripture, we should have an understanding of that scripture. Also, when we are not quoting scripture, right? When we are talking to people about Jesus and the times that are in between when we're quoting scripture and things like that, when we're not directly quoting things, it should always agree with scripture. So what do I mean by that? Well, we cannot just be saying things, whatever we want, and have that be contrary to scripture. And so it, whatever you say better at least agree with the things that are said in the Bible. Obviously, when we are talking about Jesus, we can't just be quoting scripture left and right. We have to have things in between, right? It's, it's, we're real people, and we're, if we're having real conversations with people, 
uh, we're going to be just talking about Jesus sometimes. And so everything that you say needs to agree with Scripture at the very least. Also, our preaching should proclaim the Lordship of Christ. So not only do we talk about the death, burial, and resurrection, but we need to talk about the Lordship of Christ. Acts 2, 34 through 36, it says, For David did not ascend into the heavens, but he says to himself, The Lord said to my Lord, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God has made this Jesus, whom you crucified, both Lord and Christ. This is such an important thing. People need to know that whether or not they believe in Jesus, Jesus is the Lord. And he is the one that will be judging you when you die. And so whether or not you believe Jesus is Lord, he is the Lord because God made him Lord. You see, we don't get to make the rules. God does. God made Jesus Lord. And so we need to make sure that people know that because of their sin, right, Jesus was crucified. And as Jesus that was crucified, God raised him up and made him Lord over the very people that crucified him. Jesus is the one that we will be facing on Judgment Day. Also, and this is probably the most important part of whenever we're talking to people about Jesus. This will be my last point this morning. But our preaching should direct people towards repentance. Our, our, our preaching should direct people towards repentance. Again, people should, just, should not just be comfortable with themselves when we are talking to people about Jesus. Uh, I heard Billy Graham say one time that uh, talking about how offended the world was getting with Christians, he was asked about that and he said, well, the message of the cross should be offensive. It should be offensive. People don't like to be confronted with their sin. People don't like to be confronted with the message of the cross. It should sting a little bit. It should sting a lot. Just like Peter's message here. Notice what it says about the people listening to Peter's preaching. Verse 37 through 39 it says, Now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said to them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. For the promise is to you and your children, and to all who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. Verse 37 again. They were cut to the heart. When we are sharing Jesus with people, it should cut them to the innermost fiber of their being. See, we don't need to come up with things to talk about. If we share scripture with people, if we share what Jesus did for them, it should cut them to the heart. You let the Holy Spirit do the work there. And the natural response to that is, men and brethren, what shall we do? And then you can tell them. Then you direct them towards repentance. You see, I... I know I've been a little bit harsh this morning about talking about the bad things, right? But understand that there is no forgiveness without repentance. There is, you, you cannot receive forgiveness from God without first saying, I'm sorry for my sins. I'm sorry for wronging you, God. Verse 38 there, I just want to make a note of this. This is a verse that is oftentimes quoted out of context. Um, it says, 
the, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This is not saying baptism is what saves you, okay? When Peter is saying here, first of all, you have to understand grammar here. It says, repent, comma, and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. And you see a semicolon there. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And so when you see a comma and a semicolon there, in that thought that is there, you, that is additional information. So first of all, you can take that sentence and say, repent, and you shall re receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay? So it's not saying baptism is what saves you. Repentance is what saves you. And so that now within the commas, now we got to talk about that. Now today's grammar, we say for means, uh, you, well, you do something and then you will receive something. And that's, but that's not what Old English talks about. You know, that's not what this verse is saying. It's saying that that for there is a because. And so it says, repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And then where it says for there, that actually means because. And so it's saying be, be baptized because of the remission of sins. And so because you are now saved, because you repented, you should be baptized. That's what Peter is getting at. And that is what agrees with the rest of Scripture. And so baptism is not for salvation. Repentance is for salvation. That is what is essential. And so when we quote John 3.16, right? When we quote John 3.16, that is a very good verse. But we cannot just say that good news. We have to also say that people need to repent in order to get that. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have eternal life. Right? That's great. That is great news. But repentance comes before that. Repent and believe. Those are the two things that scripture, throughout scripture says that you need to do in order to be saved. And so, I hope this wasn't too complicated this morning. Again, I was preaching about preaching, and I, like I said, this is to be done behind the pulpit and outside of our church. We need to be sharing the gospel with people, and this is how we do it. Now, I'm not saying that uh, you need to remember every single step in this, but this is the guideline for what we are to share with people. So if you are questioning what to tell people, well, look at what Peter did. Look at what the early apostles did whenever they went to go and preach. They told people about the great, wonderful things that Jesus did. They told people about the lordship of Christ. They spoke about the death, burial, and resurrection. But most of all, they convicted people. They, they pointed out sin to people. And they told them what the remedy was for it. They told them how to repent and receive Christ as their Lord and Savior. That is what is essential anytime we are talking to people. We have to tell people about the bad and the good, right? We cannot just go around telling people all of the good things. People need to be warned of the bad things too. With that, in conclusion this morning, I'll invite the pianist and song leader to come. I've been preaching about preaching this morning, but I want to say if there's anyone here that is not saved, right? All of these things you should be listening to because this was Peter preaching a message that Jesus came and died for our sins because of our sins, right? In order that we could have eternal life with God. But you have to repent and believe in him in order to receive that. You see, there's a, uh, a thing, and it's still in law today, right? If you, are, if you have a traffic fine, right? You know that someone else can pay that fine for you, and that's completely acceptable in a court of law? Well, that's what Jesus is doing, right? Except on a more extreme level. 
you are receiving a death sentence from God because of your sins. But Jesus is there waiting to off. He's offering to pay that for you. In fact, he's already paid it. All you have to do is say, yes, I want that. Yes, I forgive me. I want that from you, Lord. And you do that and you don't have to pay that penalty anymore. You get to spend eternity uh, in, in, with him in heaven. So would you do that this morning? Would you repent of your sins and believe in Jesus as your Lord and Savior?